Hello and welcome to another episode of the 1020 Podcast. Today I'm talking to Greg Connolly. Greg Connolly is a barrister at law in Sydney, Australia. His practice is mainly in constitutional law, public law, as well as corporations and resource law. And Gray has advised the Australian government on national security and public law matters. Gray served previously as a naval intelligence officer in the Royal Australian Navy in the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Oman, the Persian Gulf, East Timor, and the Middle East, including service in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Gray also periodically writes on national security and governance matters from a conservative perspective. He writes a strategy council and his Twitter is at Gray Connolly. All of Gray's comments are his own, but I highly recommend that you follow him particularly on Twitter, where he comments regularly and with a strong historical background and in the background and insightful on geopolitical events of the day. All right. Well, Graham, so 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 many thanks for you to being with me today. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation, and I'm hoping hoping that we can touch on several topics, right? The geopolitical topic, politics, but maybe at the end, if it allows, I would also kind of venture a little bit into contemporary culture because you're also a commentator on these issues. I also highly recommend to our viewers and listeners to follow Graham on Twitter. I will put his Twitter account into the bio and all the outlets and platforms where this conversation will be posted. So from the beginning, so about a month ago, like the invasion of Ukraine by Russia started. And I was wondering, could you maybe tell us a little bit since this, which things did you find surprising, right? Which things do you think went according to plan? How do you feel that the actors behaved, you know, Europe, the United States, Russia, NATO, Ukraine, kind of, if you would give it like the bigger picture about the expected and unexpected, what are some of the key points you would like to mention? Okay, in terms of the uh, expected, I I was only ever 6139 positive that the Russians would attack Ukraine. So while while I leaned towards Russia being more likely to do something than not, it was never overwhelming. I was never overwhelmingly sure that that would be the case. So 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 the fact that Russia actually did attack that that did confirm something that I thought, but even still when it happened, it was a it was something of a surprise to me. Uh, the fact that the Russians planned uh, an attack with so many different um, axes of advance on Ukraine that did surprise me. Uh, the fact that the uh, that NATO seemed almost flat-footed at the very beginning. I there will be a, another story I think written after this is all over about why that was, but there was seemingly a flat-footedness about NATO's response in the first few days. And by that, I, I do not mean like Poland or the Visegrad four countries. Poland did an incredible job, but I'm saying in NATO's brain, brain it's, it's strategic brain, there just seemed to be a freeze. And I think when the history of this is written, the failure in the first few days to really get a, a NATO mission into gear, I think will be something people will pour over. So I think there is that, because at the end of the day, if you're going to try and save the Ukrainian st state from a Russian onslaught, where obviously the two NATO allies you would work through would be Poland and Turkey on the northern and, and the southern fronts of, of Ukraine. And instead, you had a you had almost a, a inability of people in NATO to get their heads around something happening that was always on the cards that it could happen. And it seems there was a lack of agility, for lack of a better word, in how NATO went about it. Now, I think that has been corrected, but I just think there was a lack of that. I think on the Russian side, I think they obviously would be, uh, they obviously would have hoped to have made more progress around Kiev, I think. I think otherwise, I think a lot of the people who thought that Ukraine would collapse, I've never understood that. You, the Ukrainians are very, very good soldiers. Ukrainians in foreign armies do very, very well. Uh, Ukrainians outside of Ukraine have very good military histories in various allied countries. Ukrainians in the French Foreign Legion are known to be very good soldiers. The idea of Ukraine was going to collapse, I've always found very, very hard to undertake, uh, understand. Sorry, And so I found it very, very hard to take. The other thing I would say that did not surprise me, but other people talk about as surprising, is that the Russians did not use their air power as strongly in uh, in Ukraine as they, as they might otherwise have done. I think people fail to understand that the Russian way of war is different and that the Russians, and this goes back to uh, not just the Soviet times, but the times under the Tsar, the, the Russian military machine is really 
a removalist and security company that that provides services to its artillery and its rockets. So it's the big thing for the Russians, and it makes a lot of sense. If you're if you're someone who is not Russian, you may scratch your head and think, "Why is that?" Well, if you are Russian, you fight in rain, hail, shine, snow, terrible conditions. Well, what's one thing that's always going to be able to provide you with fire support? It's always going to work. Artillery and rockets. Yeah, you know, they're going to work, and so that's what you build a lot of your capacity around. So you don't use your aircraft, they're expensive, uh, you can't really afford to lose pilots because they're valuable. And so I was not surprised by that, but other people clearly were because it's all people seem to be talking about. So I, I was surprised by that. I was, I was not surprised by the brutality of the war. The facts are civil wars are the most brutal wars and, and people need to be honest, the Ukrainians and the Russians are distinct nations, but they are related. They have a long history together. And uh, as with families, when they fall apart, uh, things get very, very brutal very, very quickly. Uh, in terms of what also surprised me, I am surprised by one cardinal point, and that is the Americans have really gone uh, to uh, the extreme, I think, on the sanctions with the Russians. And I don't want that to be taken the wrong way. But what I mean is, is that the cardinal problem facing the West, and I say this as an Australian, we're allied very closely to the Americans, uh, and and we've allied very closely, obviously, to NATO. We're a partner of NATO's. One of the big problems with the relationship with Russia is that, however British Russia's conduct is, uh, for those of us in the Pacific, one of the great concerns we have is Russia and China joining together in what uh, is described as the Dragon Bear, and uh, and it's the alliance of Russia and China. And so, for for me as an Australian. It does concern me if the Americans are basically resigning uh, the, the, at least the foreseeable future to a sort of mutual containment of Russia and China. That's a major problem because obviously it's Australian, we're part of the Quad with Japan, United States and India. And India is very close to Russia. And the Indians are very close to Russia and they've made it abundantly clear that their ties to Russia are not up for discussion. And so, and so insofar as that's what India has said to uh, repeatedly is that they're not going to change their views on Russia. It's just causing, it's going to cause problems going forward. So I, I think that is one thing I did surprise me. I was surprised by the degree to which the Americans were not seeing a bigger picture. To the degree that you are driving Russia closer to China, you're helping China. And so I, I thought that was a bit unwise. I think if you, you're always going to sanction the, the Russians for something, but whether you needed to sanction them on everything at the one time, I do not think was wise because you always have to have carrots as well as sticks for good behavior or for improved behavior or reformed behavior and i think that was very very unwise because at the end of the day russia is just too big for us to to isolate russia spans 11 time zones it's a country that we really cannot we cannot pretend it does not exist even if we wanted to we cannot do that and so it's just and obviously for europeans there's, there's the energy dimension so so there's just a massive problem with how that's gone ahead and i think it shows actually up yeah you know, we, we're talking here about the last month it shows in the years leading up to this last month how little real thinking was done about the russian problem and about the russian and the chinese problem i mean obviously you know, people like us were talking about it but but obviously at a higher echelon there was just no thinking about this and yet it was a it's such an obvious problem that was going to emerge is what to do and how to manage the Russians. And I just think, um, as I've as I've written um, uh, and as I've put in in a, a recent column in the Sydney Morning Herald, it's 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 almost like the West in the last twenty years or last twenty or thirty years just took every opportunity it could to make life with the Russians unnecessarily difficult. And I say that as on who who would say fr from the West. We are never going to have a normal relationship with Russia. Russia is always going to be a problem. It's always going to be an adversarial country. It's just, it, it's the way it's always going to be. At the same time, uh, in any set of relationships, uh, either human or national, there are difficult people, though, that you need to get along with. And they're difficult and they're frustrating and they are annoying. Um, but you make, as a, as a common sense person, you make accommodations, you have to deal with them. Well, Countries sometimes are like that. And Russia is never going to be a normal country. It's always going to be a very difficult and adversarial country. But you can make it less difficult for yourself if you're smart. And I just do not think we were smart about this at all. And I think that's why we're part and part why we're here. I mean, can I add on a, another question? Is right? You, you mentioned the adversarial nature of, of Russia. But if we say, let's say, um, if we would have this conversation in the 1930s, right, that, and somebody would, would have said, 
in 20 years from now, in the 1950s, Germany and Japan will be close allies of the United States, right? We probably would have said, well, that sounds ridiculous. That's impossible, right? There will always be an antagonistic nature. Do you think it would be, even the chance might be very, very little, but do you think if particularly in the 90s, and I'm not talking about, you know, the kind of the Merschheimer and approach of not provoking, but to kind of say, okay, the Soviet Union is over, Russia is now a nation state, and kind of they'll be treated as, as a nation state that will never become a member of the West entirely because it is a Eurasian empire, but with which we are on good terms, right? Kind of that it's, it, it, so that we wouldn't have, you know, not that the dragon bear, but kind of more the whatever animal you want to pick for Europe, right? But that, that it's kind of, um, that, that, that Russia is more inclined towards Europe. I mean, I guess you're not just a commenter on geopolitics, right? You're also a, a permanent student of history. So wasn't there always a desire on, on the Russian part to be European, right? There's once a letter by Catherine the Great where she like kind of lists so here is a list why Russia is a European empire. Do, so do you think that that if if kind of one would have switched from saying, oh, you're kind of now just the Soviet Union light, you're actually now a separate country, that things could be, as you said, right, difficult but but better. Because I was I was watching very closely kind of the news reports of the last month, and I was surprised how often news commentators kind of you know used alternatively Russia or the Soviet Union. Like sometimes they realized it and they said, oh, I mean, I mean Russia, of course. But it was always this, it, it's kind of still the Soviet Union. Do you think that, that there was a window of opportunity in the 90s, maybe, and the early 2000s that the West has missed? Yes, I mean, that, that's an excellent question. I've, I have lamented at length the problem of so many people in the West, and this is particularly among Anglophone analysts, who are stuck in 1985. They think they're still in the Cold War. They think Russia is still the Soviet Union. And they think this is just the, 1980, the 1980s on replay. To the, point where, to the point where they expect Biden to behave like Reagan. I mean, it's just, it's just, I mean, apart from the forgetfulness, I just don't think that's going to happen. But, 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 but it's just, it's one of those problems, as you say, about the lack of, of foreseeability. But looking back as a student of history, and I, I was at school, um, what we would call high school, and then I was at university in the 90s. And I remember, the, I can remember that time where there was a certain optimism. Gorbachev talked about, a Europe from the Urals to the Atlantic. And, and there was this idea of Russia reorientating itself to the West, but not as a threat, but as a part of a sort of common European homeland. And that, that was a real thing. People genuinely believe that. I think, I think where a lot of that really came apart was when the West got very, very heavily involved in the former Yugoslavia. And this is well before the, the NATO is bombing Serbia. It was just the fact that I think there was a certain cavalier attitude on many Western countries that, that they, were, they were treading into a Russian sphere and a historic Russian sphere at a time when Russia was on its knees and it was in a very difficult situation. And I think that caused unnecessary tensions. At the same time, you know, the Russians obviously needed help. It was in our interest to provide it to them. I mean, the Russians had such a huge nuclear arsenal. We all had an interest in it not going astray. And so we all we all wanted to sort of help the Russians and to and to sort of move the Russians into a a situation if, if of we're not going to be best friends but we can at least have an, a workable relationship. And then obviously came September 11, and then obviously came the invasion of Iraq. Obviously Iraq was a client state of the former Soviet Union and had been close to Russia in the same way that Syria is very close to Russia in the same way that Serbia was close to Russia. And there were just a series of conflicting points that I think just one built upon the other. I, I've, I've always pointed to people, that Putin speech in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference, I think is a really, really important thing for people to understand because I, I think Putin is far less important than everyone makes out. I think whoever the Russian president is would have many of the same views. I mean, one of the points made uh, by Boris Rifkin, which I think is a very important point, is, is that uh, the, the, this, the assassinated Russian opposition leader, Boris Nemtsov, yeah, and he, he, in some respects, could have been the, the president of Russia. He could have actually taken over from Yeltsin, not Putin. It could have been Boris Nemtsov. Boris Nemtsov himself, in 1999, was in Serbia protesting you know, NATO being involved in the, in the war in Yugoslavia. And so, uh, or at least Nemtsov was a very, very strong critic of that. So the idea that, you know, oh, well, we could, everything would be different if we had Navalny or Nemtsov in power. And the facts are, they're not. Because if you're... If you're the Russian president, and I don't care who you are, you have to command the confidence of certain spheres of Russian life in the Russian elite. 
and they're not going to let you get away with a policy of pr Russia perennially being allowed to be the bear that just keeps getting poked. And so I think, for my part, there was a lost opportunity. Uh, it was a great regret for those of us who live in the Asia Pacific, because obviously we're very concerned about China. And it would have actually been good to have at least, if not a friendly Russia, a Russia that was non-belligerent or non-confrontational non to the north of China to at least keep the Chinese mind occupied. And unfortunately, all we've done with policy, and look, the Russians are to blame as well, but all we've done with a lot of our policies unhelpfully is push Russia closer to China. And I think that's a great regret because I think I'm, I imagine that young Russians, uh, and certainly if you work in, in, in you know, professional services areas, uh, you know, you come across people from the former Soviet Union and they sort of want their countries to be part of a, a, a broader world that they, that they relate to, and which has really been one of the sort of battlegrounds of Russian thought since at least the 1700s, the battles between the Westernizers and the Slavophiles and those who want to have Russia turning outward or Russia turning inward. And I think all we've done is, is, is basically forge a coalition between people, whatever their views are, they take the view we've got to put Russia first, we're under attack, and people are going to isolate us. Well, then that's fine. We've we've been here before, and we're going to we're going to dig in. And I I think that's just a really big problem. I I just I think everyone's focused on the current war, understandably, but everyone's focused on the current war. But this war will end. All wars end, and we're going to have to pick up the pieces from there. Now, obviously, we're going to have to help rebuild the Ukrainians and help them get back on their feet. But the Russians are still going to be there in all their 11 time zones, in all their 6,000 nuclear weapons, et cetera, the Russians are still going to be there. And pretending that they're not going to be there and pretending that you know, we, we can just have permanently bad relations with a country like Russia, I think it's just stupid. It doesn't mean you have good relations, but it does mean you have to try and work through the grievances in a way that does not make them worse. Do you think that some people might believe that you can treat Russia like, you know, Serbia in the 90s or Iraq uh, in between the 90s until the invasion of 2003 or Cuba during the embargo times? Do you think that some people delude themselves that you can treat, as you say, right, sheer by size and, and, and military power and nuclear power, that you can treat a country like Russia like one of those other countries? Yes, I, I do. That's one of my great fears is, is that in, in America... The same, uh, the same crew, basically, that brought us the Iraq war in 20 years in Afghanistan and the disaster in Syria, the same groups of people who are completely unreflective, who are unwilling to learn from history, who are unwilling to take any advice from anyone, who are unwilling to apply common sense, they seem to be in the ascendant. Now, there are some smart people in America who are not like that. The, the current CIA director, William Burns, he strikes me as a very, very impressive man. Um, he was the one who wrote the, the memorandum to Condoleezza Rice in 2008, telling her in no uncertain terms, if you bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, everyone in Russia will be against you. And Burns', Burns memorandum is very interesting to read because he says, this is not just the knuckle draggers and the Neanderthals. This is very liberal, very well-spoken, very you know, global Russians who will tell me this. They say, this is an absolute red line. And guess what we then went on to do, stupidly. So I, I am greatly concerned that there are people who think you can genuinely isolate Russia. And we're about to have a test case in this because uh, obviously the Russians and the Ukrainians between them account for so much of the global wheat trade. Uh, the Russians obviously supply energy to Europe. Um, the Russians are very, very active in the Arctic, which should, which is something that's not paid close attention to outside say, of Canada and the United States. It's a very, very big issue, the Russian activity in the Arctic. The Russians are looking to also open up the Arctic as a, as a, as a route for transport uh, and for shipping. So... Yeah, the Russians, the Russians have their own plans. And I think this is this goes back to my point about Russia's never going to be a normal country. Russia will always be a you know, imperially minded country. It just is. And we're foolish to ever think we're ever going to have like a group hug with the Russians. We're not. They're always going to be difficult and they're always going to have ambitions. The point being is there are lots of countries in the world that all have ambitions, but we somehow manage to work with them. And the Russians, we're just going to have to simply because they hold cards that we cannot take out of their hands. And we, we cannot change, short of literal World War III, we cannot change the fact Russia occupies 11 time zones. Yeah, we can't. If you, if you want to fly from Europe to, to Asia or vice versa, or you want to move, you want to move cargo across the world, you have to deal with the Russians. Yeah, I'm sorry, but, but it's reality of life. It's their airspace. You have to deal with them. And, and it's just one of those things where the problem, the problem itself, when you sit down, you look at a map and you ponder everything, the problem itself is difficult enough. The secret, I think, of, of your success is 
not making unforced errors that make it even more difficult. Because I think the problem is already difficult enough. And I think people who are realistic, particularly if you're a conservative person and you can calm down and you can calmly look at the situation, I think you have to calmly look at the situation, look at a map, look at where your various interests are, and you have to be realistic about the fact that the Russians are just people we're just going to have to negotiate with at some point. Now, we may want to put them in the freeze. We may want to put them in a timeout for now, but there's going to come a time where we're going to have to bring them out of the freeze. We're going to have to talk to them. Do you think there is a, a cultural dimension to this? Because you mentioned countries that have ambitions. And I found it always curious to say, okay, what drives those ambitions? And do you think it's possible to say that, because I think this would apply to China as well, right? There are countries, right, that really think that national greatness, that, you know, that, that kind of the, 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 the way they look at the world, you know, it matters to us what our position in the world is, right? To kind of to get up in the morning and say, it matters to me what the world thinks of Russia, what the world thinks of China. And that we in the West, if you excuse this generalization, that we have completely given up on this, right? That we believe you stand up in the morning and say, you know, gosh, I wonder, you know, if I can have a new coffee brand or, you know, you know, the, the size of my car. Again, I'm, 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 I'm simplifying, I'm, I'm provocative here. But that, that kind of we, we really looked at Russia and we look at China and we saw them completely different than they saw themselves, right? And so, so our intentions or the Western intentions might have been pure, right? There's a little bit the argument also with NATO expansion, the EU expansion. And I think that's not entirely wrong, right? That, that, it, that it's well intended, but this is not how it is perceived, right? Because for these countries, again, patriotism, nationalism, national identity, that still matters. And that since we have given up on that, we, we, we literally cannot understand them, not just linguistically, but culturally, that there is a, a gap that's very hard to bridge. I think that's, that's an excellent point. That's that's a point I absolutely agree with. I, I think the fascinating thing, though, is I think the West is the outlier. I think the rest of the world still thinks that way. I mean, and and to the degree that uh, that there is a Western outlier, the Americans think that way. Americans think, rightly, they have an exceptional country. They've achieved exceptional things. You know, think about the moon landing and so on. The Americans do do exceptional things when they put their minds to it. And they would never accept being an ordinary country. And, and good on them, I say, good on them. You should never accept being an ordinary country. I'm an Australian. We're not a people known for humility. and uh, uh, But, you know, we, we consider ourselves, you know, in our massive continent at the bottom of the world, we think we have something very special as well. Every country feels that way, or at least it should feel that way. And certainly China is obviously the classic case of this because the Chinese not only think that way as a middle kingdom, but they have grievances. You know, they had it, they'd, Century, a century of humiliations. And so they had a situation where at gunpoint, they foreign countries forced them to open up their ports and basically to give over parts of their territories to foreign countries to basically use to trade with them on terms that were not advantageous. So the Chinese have genuine grievances. India does not consider itself to be a normal country. It's, you know, it's 1.4 billion people. India does not consider itself to be a normal country. It's actually only the West that seems to think that everyone else should play by these rules of tempering your expectations. Um, anyone who's been in the Middle East and worked in the Middle East or served in the Middle East, I mean, the specter of Iran hangs over everything. It, it just does. Um, uh, I, so I served in the Persian Gulf. And you know, one of the things when you when you uh, navigate and you pass through the Strait of Hormuz, uh, you will have a visit from the Iranians in some form. Now, un unlikely the Iranians are going to pick a fight with you, but they want to remind you that they are there. And it's the Persian Gulf for a reason. And it's, it's their lake. And they want to make sure that everyone knows that Iran's there because Iran has has ambitions of its own. And by dint of size and its ability to organize itself and to do things, Iran is a power that has to be reckoned with. And you know, we, we fought two long wars on either side of Iran in Iraq and Afghanistan. And to our our uh, to, to, to our disadvantage, we did not get on with the Iranians. They supplied resistance movements in both uh, areas of operations, which did great damage to us. And so you know, you have to understand countries on their own terms. And you have to understand that when you move into their historic domains, uh, which, you know, in the Russian case is, is demarcated by places that not only once belonged to the Soviet Union, they once belonged to the Tsars. And whenever I say that, people go, well, you know, parts of Poland belong to the Tsars. I understand all that, but I, I'm putting to you what the Russian thinks. And this is not a minority Russian view. This is not a freak Russian view. This is a generally held Russian view. That, that they have a domain that the West should the West should respect, and and I think it's something it's a failure of imagination. I think is what I'm trying to say. There is just a failure of imagination in the West in understanding how other countries think, how other people if think. I, if, I, I think if I may, if I may interrupt you real quick, just, just so wouldn't be that 
but you, you, because you mentioned this, this is kind of almost a trigger phrase for me. You said a failure of imagination. Isn't that kind of almost repeating itself what happened in 2001 after 9-11, right? Which was also kind of a, a failure of imagination in a certain sense? Yes, yes, that's a, very good, that's a very good point. Yes, that is a failure of imagination. I mean, the failure of imagination for many people in relation to the invasion of Ukraine was, why would the Russians do this? They are earning so much uh, from supplying energy to Europe. Anything the Russians do in Ukraine is going to cost them in terms of sanctions and the like. There's just no way they would do that. And that all makes sense. If you are, if you are a Westerner and you grew up in a, in a sort of post-everything sort of society where being friends with people is your big thing and you want to be well thought of and you want to be thought of as nice people, that matters. The Russians don't think that way. They, they, they think of themselves as a, a nation that has a role in the world that, that's important. And they cannot have a situation where they are basically being mistreated or disrespected. And that's why they did what they did. Now, that doesn't explain all of it or even a huge part of it. But there is a psyche there that underlies it. And if your psyche is that I am important and that we must be respected, then you can find whatever you need as a fig leaf to cover for the fact that, that your feelings of disrespect and your feelings of weakness or isolation are why you are doing what you are doing. And I think that is very much behind uh, the Russian example. And I, I wrote a piece on, on this, and I obviously used the analogy, I know it's a tired analogy, but it's an analogy, of you know, Russia is the bear and don't poke the bear, et cetera. And people got obsessed, upset with me. They said, well, why would you call Russia the bear? The fact that Russia since, forget the Soviets, the Tsarist times, was looked upon as being like a bear. And why is that? Bears have domains. Uh, they are fine if you're away from, away from them. But once you enter their domains and you threaten them, they have, they're ferocious. They're the, they're the the ultimate land predator. And there's a reason for that, that you think of that way, is that the Russians you can deal with in a way that's, 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 that's reasonable, but they are difficult. And if they take offence at something, um, if they, they feel threatened, then they will lash out. Now, in some respects, a number of people who are listening to this will say the Russians will lash out anyway. But the facts are you should be trying to minimise problems by having dialogue and having a clear understanding of where everyone stands. I mean, do you think this is a very provocative question? You don't have to answer it, but I'm just very curious to get to get your take on it. Isn't that in a sense, if we look back, particularly the American foreign policy over the last year, that, that for example, then Donald Trump might, he was an outlier, let's say, within the Western perspective, but the way he acted on the international stage, kind of this idea that it's not about popularity, but about power, kind of that, that even the idea of America first, right, that seems, again, was an outlier in, in the contemporary political culture in Europe and the United States, was something that, as you mentioned, India, China, even Russia, I think they intuitively grasped what is meant by that, right? They probably would have said, of course, it's your own country first. What, what else would you do as a politician? And that might be an explanation why, in hindsight, Maybe the Trump administration's foreign policy was not all that bad. Oh no, I've I've always said that. I've always said put Trump aside. A lot of it is an act, but in terms of in terms of Trump's foreign policy, he probably had the best foreign policy of any U.S. president since the first Bush. In the sense of, I mean, imagine telling people ten years ago that Donald Trump will be president. He will have the Saudis and the Israelis talking to each other. And now, now we just we we just look upon Israel having contact with the Saudis and the Emiratis. We now look upon that as just normal. We're not surprised by that anymore. I mean, that was, that was an amazing achievement. Any other US president had achieved that, he would have got the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, it's a massive achievement. The other thing with Trump is, I think Trump did two things. One is he told the Europeans what every other US president had said privately, but Trump just said it out loud, which is, you cannot look to us to protect you forever on the cheap. We're not here to protect you against the Russians while you're getting cheap Russian energy. And you know, Trump, Trump reduced these things to basic things. You know, Trump basically being a property guy, uh, he's the world's most difficult landlord. I mean, that's you know, that's 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 how Trump approached things. And I think I think Trump though could get on with you know people like Macron and Macron. French presidents have to be for France. I mean, that's what you have to do. Trump could get on with Macron. He could get on with Putin in a very businesslike way. I always say to people, I I just do not think the Russians would have invaded Ukraine under Trump. This is not a political thing. It's just Trump was always a little bit crazy enough and also a little bit pragmatic enough that I'm not sure the Russians ever really worked him out. I always found it strange about the, the Trump-Russia thing is that I, I just I just don't think the Russians ever really worked Trump out. And I think that um, I, don't, I just do not see this, this happening under Trump. And I also think Trump would be pragmatic enough to have cut a deal 
with the Russians to try and avoid this happening as well. Um, so I, 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 I think Trump actually handled a lot of those things well. I think Trump's team, um, to the degree they were, they were involved, uh, they did a good job. I mean, the strangest thing with Trump is the closest Trump came in foreign policy terms to disaster, which really I think was when the Iranians shot down the American drone, it was John Bolton and the sort of neoconservatives that were urging Trump to declare war and to bomb Iran. Trump's own instincts, which were to just, it's a drone, who cares? Like, it's, I'm not going to lose sleep over this. Trump's own instincts were right. But the thing is, the actual American foreign policy establishment was there just banging the drum for Trump to bomb Iran. I mean, imagine if that had happened. It would have been an absolute disaster. Um, the other thing is, I, I, think, I think one of the other big problems that no one wants to talk about is that I just don't think you can really approach the current problem in Ukraine without reflecting on the just disastrous end in Afghanistan last year. I, I personally think the Russians saw that as a sign of, it was a, it was a NATO operation in general, but, but just there was an allied lack of cohesion and allied lack of planning. That was just an absolute disaster. And I think the Russians saw that and thought, we may never, ever get this opportunity again in our lifetimes. And we may as well strike because I, I honestly think that I think there's part of, I, I have no insight into that, but I just think the Russians must have thought this is such a disaster. It's been so poorly planned. They're deluding themselves when the, the, the Americans were saying that the Afghan regime would last. But not clearly it was not going to do so. And I think the Russians just took the view that they have no idea what they're doing. They're weak. They're, they're, they're feckless. And this is our best chance. This is the best chance we will get to do something in our domain. And so we're going to grab it. And I, I, I honestly think that had a huge role in the last in the events of the last month is the Russians convincing themselves that you know, the, the West is not really up to it or it's not very serious about things. Now, I think the R Russians have got a, a wake up call to the degree that NATO has responded seriously in some ways. But I still think the Russians deep down don't take the West particularly seriously. And I think this is a big problem because the Chinese watch that as well. You think that you might just touch on something very important, right? There has not been the argument that this has been like this wake up call now. Germany is spending a hundred billion more for the military, and NATO supposedly, I have some doubts about this, is more unified than ever, and the West is more unified than ever. Do you think that will last, right? Because we touched a little bit on the cultural dimension. And I think this plays into this. Now, now there's this shock moment, right? Very similar again to 9 11 and 2001, right? In the immediate aftermath, right? There was even the United States, right? There was like kind of this, this show of force, this show of unity. But how do you think will things develop? Let's if, if we try to look in a crystal ball. Let's say you know two months from now, four months from now. Also in light of the, the negotiations currently between Russia and Ukraine in in Turkey, do you think that deep down Americans maybe less so, but Europeans would just love like you know for some kind of settlement so that things can go back to you know, quote unquote uh, to normal and that that everything kind of this this additional military spending and the supposed you know uh, newfound self confidence. That this kind of will will wither away in the in the coming weeks. That is a great. That is a, such a good question. Being honest, I just do not see it lasting. I think there's already divisions apparent. I think, to his credit, the French president Macron has been trying to end the war. I think he sees very clearly what a disaster it will be for the world outside of Europe if the war continues. Obviously, the French have long historic interests in the Middle East. Obviously, Lebanon. Lebanon relies heavily on Russia and Ukraine for its food. Obviously, Macron can see there that's I can identify one clear disaster if we do not end this war. So I, I just do not see the French, for instance, wanting to continue the war and continue the belligerence of the Russians. I think the Germans have a history of making great claims about what they're going to do and then slow, slow, slowing the follow through. And so I'm not entirely sure about that. I think the Visegrad four countries, they will certainly have a more unified approach. I think the Poles will very much be in the lead. I think NATO itself will have to really focus itself around Poland. I think Poland will become even more important. And so I, that's what I see happening. But I, I just think the moment of unity will pass and I think people will go back to pursuing their own interests. I think already in the sanctions, the Italians were not particularly strongly for the sanctions. Um, I, I'm not sure that where the French came down on it. I, I honestly could not find a defined French position in it. And I, I'm not criticising them that. It's that they've got their own interests. Mm. I mean, you know, it's, it's very strange whenever I, whenever I praise Macron for trying to end the war, people go, oh, the French, you know, they don't, they don't take the Russians seriously. The French have issues with the Russians all over the world. I mean, the French, French have real issues with the Russians in Africa. I said the idea that the French are somehow friendly to the Russians is ridiculous. The French, French see the Russians without illusions, but they, they realise that 
there's no point prolonging something that's just stupid, which the war is. The war is fundamentally stupid. And the longer it goes on, the more it's going to hurt Ukraine. It just is. I mean, the Russia is a garrison state. People need to get this through their head. Russia is a garrison state. Russia, if it wants to grind out a win, it can. If Russia wants to escalate the war, it can. So the longer the war goes on, the more it's just going to hurt Ukraine. You know, it's I, I love as you know, I personally, I love a heroic last stand. Okay. So, yeah, grew up, you know, we all love a heroic last stand, but it is a last stand and you lose. And that's not good for a country. So the Ukrainians have performed very heroically. We want to help them, but I think one of the best ways we can help them is to end the war. And whatever carrot and sticks we can use to help them end the war, I think is good. Um, so I just I just otherwise just do not see the the moment of unity lasting. I think I, I just I just I just I just do not see that moment of unity lasting very long. At the end of the day, uh, one of the big problems they're going to have is that if the energy picture, the, if, if the energy aspect of the equation is not sorted out, particularly before the next northern winter, then you're going to have really big problems. And I just do not see how you could possibly solve the energy side in six months or so. I mean, just, just the idea, like, for instance, of shipping bulk uh, liquefied natural gas, and I'm saying this in Australia, you know, we export it. It's obviously something we do. I mean, there's just not the capacity to do it. Even if you wanted to do it, there's not the capacity to do it. So to some degree, you're just stuck with Russian supply. And if and if your if your energy provider is upset with you, that's that's an existential problem. And so they, these are all the these are all the just the real issues. I mean, you can you can be as upset and and angry as you want. And there's nothing wrong with that. If we're, we're all human beings, we'll get upset. You can be as upset and angry as you want, but there are just certain realities that just are there that you cannot deal away and you and you have to deal with. And I think that's just the real, I think that's the reason why the, the unity is is not going to last because there are other problems which involve the Russians that you're just not going to be able to escape from. I mean, I think even the Poles are still paying for Polish, uh, for Russian gas at the moment, at the same time as Poland is obviously the, the, the shipping point for all the weapons to go into Ukraine to fight the Russians. I mean, I mean, it's just it's just reality of life. That's that's what happens. Same same way the you know, the Iran nuclear talks are going on. The Russians are a participant in that. You know, in one theater we're fighting the Russians through a Ukrainian proxy, and another we're dealing with the Russians in relation to Iran. I mean, it's just it's just life. It's very very difficult. And the one thing I do commend the French on particularly is just their their, their realism about the problem and about the fact this is a problem that needs to be solved soon. I mean, you mentioned this a little bit, right? we talked about unity in the West, but maybe we can also touch upon the so-called international community, right? This has become like a very famous talking about, you know, here on pundits and, and, and politicians, right? It's about who's on the right side of history and the, the world stands with Ukraine. And I agree with you, right? I mean, if I could pick a winner in this fight, definitely it would be Ukraine, right? So I, I also, I can, from a moral perspective, from a personal perspective, there can be no doubt about this. But if you look at a global map, right, and some of them have been circulated recently, well, it's not really the world that stands against Russia, right? They might, you know, they occasionally voice their support for the Ukrainian case. But when it comes to sanctions, for example, or, or condemning Russia, it's much more limited, right? It's China, it's India, it's pretty much all of Africa, the Middle East, South America. Do you think that is a reflection and something we're probably going to talk about more in the future that we have to grapple with? The period, and this pains me, right? But that the period of Western dominance, it, it's over, right? And I think this is now, or is, 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 for now, right? It's in a, in, it's in trouble. It's in crisis. Let's put it this way. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's in trouble. I'm, I wouldn't say it's over simply because the West is such the engine for technical discoveries, for knowledge. Um, you know, just the, the sheer panoply of universities, for lack of a better word, that the West has that that nowhere else really has, or at least as yet. So the West, the West has certain natural, you know, if I can put it this way, first mover advantages, etc. But I think it's also just a failure to realise that. When people use phrases like the wrong side of history, which I think anyone using that should immediately be ignored. I think it's such a stupid phrase in, in this in this regard. Because if you're if you're if you're even America, even if you're America, you know, as powerful as America is, and you're trying to tell India, 1.4 billion people who it can be friends with, you know, India is like in prime strategic location in the literal middle of the world. It's one of the most important places. Well. You're trying to tell India. Who they can be friends with. Yeah, America trying to tell Israel and Saudi Arabia who they can be friends with. And I think the one of the big problem is is to is to go back to not just the war in Syria, but to go back to say to the Arab Spring. So to go back 10 years ago. If you're Israel and Saudi Arabia, you are probably less concerned about what happens in Ukraine because you live in a dangerous neighborhood. And I'm sorry, if you live in Israel or Saudi Arabia, you're very well aware of, of war and bad things happening because they happen in your neighborhood. So you're not shocked. 
in the way that, say, some sort of Californian uh, drinking a red wine, watching television is shocked. You know, you're not shocked. But one thing you do remember is the last time the Americans got into a fit of moral outrage about being on the right side of history, the Americans got in behind the Arab Spring, which led to the toppling of Mubarak, which was an absolute disaster, and, and the compromise, almost the compromise of the Suez Canal. And so if you're Israel or Saudi Arabia, you would remember in that period of time, the Russians didn't go in for any of that. The Russians were a force of stability. The Americans were a force for revolution. And insofar as Russian policy never changes and American policy often changes, logic dictates getting on well with the Russians because at least that's a reliable thing and that's a reliable partner. And I'm, people hate someone like me saying that, but it's just reality. I mean, when the Americans went in to, uh, to try and do regime change, firstly in Libya and then in Syria, they set loose things that were an absolute disaster for not only the people there and particularly for the religious minorities there, it was a disaster for Europeans because you had a massive outflow of refugees. They, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's all well and good to sit in your think tank in Washington, D.C. You're not going to be dealing with the human fallout of this. You know, it's very, very different to what actually happened, particularly in Syria, where most people in Europe were going cap in hand to Erdogan to ask him to turn the human spigot of refugees off because they were, they were threatening to come into Europe in such large numbers as to overwhelm the refugee, set, uh, refugee reception areas and basically gave rise to extremist political parties. And so it was just, it was just such a disaster. It was all born of the American idea that uh, you know, Assad must go and Gaddafi must go. I mean, who are you to say that? Like, it's not your country. Like, it's, it's, it's not your country to say that. And if you do say that, guess what? It's not going to work because there will be people with vested interests in those countries who are going to fight you. And so we ended up spending the last 20 years with with Amer American political class that could not find Libya or Syria on a map uh, without you know, large pointers and who would have absolutely no idea about the factions that fight there or how dangerous these places are. And so they were doing all these very, very stupid things. And so for people like Israel and Saudi Arabia, who used to be reliable and, and are reliable allies of, of, of the West and particularly of the Americans, but, but who paused and thought, this is insane and we're not going along with this. And and they look at the Russians and they think, well, the Russians are, you know, whatever we think of their domestic, how they run their domestic affairs, they are a reliable interlocutor. They don't cause surprises. Um, they don't go in for moralistic crusading. And perhaps we can deal with them in a common sense way. And I think the one big problem, uh, we, you know, when people look at the map of who is actually sanctioning Russia, and it is basically the, the West doing it, a lot of the rest of the world's not. People just got to accept the fact that when Putin said, uh, Putin said a number of years ago, a phrase along the lines of, Russia will be the friend of whoever wants to be the friend of Russia. That's a very easy idea for people to understand. That's not a difficult concept for people to understand. And, and the, the West, meanwhile, wants to have relationships with people and run the ruler over them and, and give them lectures and tell them how to run their lives. And they must do this. and They must do that. And don't be surprised when people don't want to be your friend. They find you difficult. They find you painful and and they don't want to be your friend and the russians did a very good job of cultivating uh other countries and other countries leaderships and making friends and i think a lot of that difference in how sanctions have been treated is the fruits of that both the russians and the chinese have very pragmatic attitudes towards making friends and to to making allies and to developing relationships with people it's, it's one of the big problems for uh for countries like particularly like australia is the chinese are very very successful for instance in our region in corrupting local elites and making friends with people and, and basically presenting a benign face. And uh, I, I was reading the other day, there was a comment by an African. He said, he said by an African leader, and he said, uh, when the Chinese come here, uh, when they leave, we get like a we get like an airport or something from it. When the Americans come here, we get a lecture. And uh, or, or was it the Chinese give us a lecture hall and the Americans give us a lecture? I mean, it's 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 such a it's a kind of funny throwaway, but it's a neat encapsulation of the problem. And so I, I think that there is a problem with how the West understands the rest of the world. And I think the West, I, I, I don't really see the West as being like in any kind of eclipse, because I think it's always been a kind of multipolar world. I think that's always been with us in some way, shape or form. But I just think the West needs to understand its place. And certainly in relation to countries that are good allies, and Israel, India, Saudi Arabia, they are good allies, you do not treat good allies as good friends by wagging your finger at them and saying, you have to join me on this when they clearly have equities elsewhere. And I just, I just think we're, we're basically paying the cost there for the last 20 years of just stupid 
uh, crusading, uh, and I don't mean that in any religious sense, I mean that in a sort of ideological sense, in the in places like the Middle East and Africa, which I think just not helped us at all. And uh, I think the, the, the one interesting point that no one wants to touch on is that the West basically after the Cold War became an ideological power and the Russians became a purely pragmatic sort of semi-imperial power. You know, the reversal of, 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 of roles in the Cold War, where the Soviet Union was the ideological power, the West decided to become the ideological power and started to decide things ideologically. And that's just a stupid way to go about doing things. I want to I want to stick with this a little bit because I think you mentioned a couple of really important things now, and uh, one that you spoke, for example, about the advantage we have regarding you know the technological advantage, the universities, and also the last point about becoming more an ideological and less a pragmatic power. So if I connect those two two thoughts, like one is the the most pessimistic view, I guess, is that we could say kind of the West is in a situation as China was in the 16th century, right? We are at the moment technologically advanced. But there are, you know, there are elements of stagnation. There are elements of, of, you know, cognitive dissonance. Right, we focus on the wrong things. Right, that the universities, for example, you know, uh, without, without going too much into it, but where it's, it's more ideology. You know, it's, it's all, you know, woke ideology. These kind of things, and no longer the things that matter to then translate into power and foreign policy. But also, what you said about ideological power in Russia, right? Isn't it the case? And I think we see this. If you think about the Soviet Union, where you had instances where, for example, you know. The game of chess needs to be de-bourgeoisized, right? So kind of, and, and genetics is, you know, you know, is, is, is a bourgeois science. But, and, and everybody laughed at that and said, well, those ideological fools, what are they talking about? But now we live in a world, right, where you can open up the Washington Post and it says, you know, scientists not sure what a woman is. Or another one, right, is math racist, question mark. I mean, I think this, I love your point so much because isn't it a little bit that not just in the you know pragmatic world, ideological, but even culturally, kind of we now take on more and more characteristics. I'm not saying we are, but we take more and more the characteristics of like the ideological fanatic, whereas those whom we claim are ideological fanatics are actually they are nationalists, right? They might be even imperialist, but they are fairly pragmatic about it. And wouldn't that mean on the long run that we are actually in a weaker position? Oh, absolutely. I, 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 the, I just find it fascinating in the sense the thing that triggered me was you know the arguments where. If you ask people on, say, the the woker left elements of of politics, and I, I by that I don't mean like the old left social democrats who want a better outcome for working people. I I like those people. I I share a lot of their ambitions. I they're good people. No, I, what I mean is like the wokey left, and it's funny because it, during the Cold War, you know, the Russians, or oh, sorry, the Soviets were lampooned for a lot of the things they did that were ideologically driven. And so you had Lysenkoism, which was the service of science for the communist agenda. And you fast forward to now, where instead in the West, we have a former, a formerly uh, you know, factual uh, absolutist in the sense of one plus one equals two culture of thinking about facts. And it's now reduced to this idea that, well, you know, perhaps men can have children. You know, perhaps we cannot define what a woman is, all these sorts of things, because no one wants to make anyone upset. And it's just, it's it's just, it's nonsense. And the strange thing is you're unsure whether this is a passing phase that we're all going to come out of. And this is just one of those crazy times that no one will believe that they live through. And you'll have to tell children and grandchildren about you never believe what happened, you had to live through it. And you have no idea if that's the case or whether this is some more permanent sort of takeover by a sort of crazy uh, overeducated middle class people, and and the strange thing is, in nowhere else in the world does this really happen. So there's no one in there's no one in China or Russia or India currently having debates about you know trans issues. I'm not saying trans people shouldn't be treated well, but I'm saying I'm just saying they're not issues. Now, to be fair, in India they actually do have a third gender, so so they they probably feel they don't need to. But but I'm just saying these aren't issues that are front burner issues. The much more important national issues are. And so I just think it's just something that's very, very strange in the West. The other thing is, I think social media has got to some of the blame for it. It amplifies uh, bad ideas and, and strange people with bad ideas in a way in the West it does not do in other parts of the world. Um, I think it's also got something to do with the long legacy in the West of the 1960s and the assault on established hierarchies and established ways of knowing things and how you learn things and the fact that you know post the 1960s everything was up for debate everything was up for challenge no matter how self of self-evidently true everything was to be you know deconstructed and questioned and so on in a way that i just not sure happened anywhere else in the world 
but in the West, that certainly happened. And I think we're just we're just living with the consequences of that that long sixty year revolution. And I think that's something that no one in the West sort of wants to admit is that perhaps a lot of our problems go back to that. And like all problems in polities, you know, most you know most nations and most great powers. They, they die by suicide, not murder. I mean, they generally, through a series of self-inflicted wounds, debilitate themselves. And I, that's my great fear. I, I'm, less, I'm, I'm less concerned about the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians than I am about what we do to ourselves in our own societies. And that concerns me quite a, great, quite a, quite a good deal. It actually concerns me all the more now uh, just by the sheer, the sheer uh, missionary zeal that a lot of people who believe these things how much they have this in their brain all the time. And I think it's something that we as a society are going to have to come to grips with because I think it's ultimately unsustainable. Do you think it's maybe primarily, and which doesn't make it better, but like an elite phenomenon, like something that I, I was seeing over the last couple of weeks, right? There's again, there's like a strong push uh, by German economists, right? But in Austria, the same, Europe, the same, you know, that an energy embargo must come, right? Even if it means... You know that the economy takes a hit, and that, that we have a recession, and the I think that the, the kind of the, the worst thing that they expect is a shrinking of GDP by six percent. I find this very optimistic, but be that as it may. But and another thing, of course, a lot of this energy dependence is a consequence of which, in general, I think is an important issue, but it was handled wrong. Right, it's a consequence of an obsession with you know challenging climate change or confronting climate change. So elites drove an agenda that drove us into energy dependence. And now the same elites are asking for, uh, you know, well, people need to take a hit uh, for, for Ukraine. And what I'm saying, and again, we can agree with this from a strategic level, but don't you think at some point, what whatever is left of, let's say, the lower middle class and working class, that they're going to say, well, it's easy for you to say with, you know, a six-figure salary every year that it doesn't matter if the electricity bill doubles. But if I have, you know, $30,000 a year, it matters if I pay 80 or 40 euros a month for electricity. That this really kind of also sets the stage, not as simple, but really kind of, and, and it translates that into, we cannot trust you guys on domestic issues. We no longer want you to tell us what our foreign policy agendas should be. And maybe this is just as an add-on, isn't this, you think, a little bit reflected also in certain trends that I'm kind of in between? I'm not sure if I approve of them or not, but certain trends you see on the American right, kind of where you have a, not just a new isolationism, but really kind of a, an anti-elite sentiment in, in, in a way. Yes, no, no, I agree with you. I mean, I think a lot of our maladies were brought by bad elites. Like I, I genuinely think a lot of our problems are caused by bad elites and almost having a form of smaller liberalism that almost has a religious significance to it. So, and it has its totemic issues. Climate change is one of them. Uh, wokeism is another one and so on. Now, all of us, I think, are for a cleaner environment. So I think that's something we're all in favour of. All of us are for treating everyone politely and being understanding of people and understanding of people who are different to you. I think we're all committed to that. I'd be very surprised if there were many people who were not, uh, particularly listening to this podcast. I think everyone wants to be kind and polite to people. But I think one of the big problems is elites across the Western world, and it varies in countries, but obviously the Americans are something of an outlier because they tend to do things in a way that's overdone, both good and bad. And so they tended to get into the into the uh, craze, the craze of crazes more than other people are. Uh, I think I think that's that's just something that's been foisted upon societies in a way that is hard for people in say middle and working classes to understand because you know it's it's not something they ever consented to. It's nothing they were ever told was coming. And instead they are just expected to just go along with what the sort of I guess, secular priestly class of the modern sort of liberal elite, what they dictate is the new norm. And I think what they're not going to realise is that actually, no, people don't do that. That You lost them. You lost their trust ages ago. And no, they're not going to click their heels and go along with you on this. I think the energy one is is one because the, the obvious answer to a lot of the problems, both climate and energy supply is, say, nuclear power. But but nothing has been uh, harder to, to get built and 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 operated just despite its obvious merits as a zero emissions reliable energy source, the nuclear power. It's just it's insane. I mean, the Germans. You know, I, I was just shocked at how antediluvian the Germans were with nuclear power. I mean, this is Germany. You know, I'm saying this is a multi generational Mercedes owner. I mean, it's just the Germans sort of went down this almost antediluvian path of believing in all these ridiculous renewable energy schemes, and then when push comes to shove, they're basically dependent on the Germans. They're basically an energy vassal of the Russians. And so 
you just have this sort of strange way of approaching these things. And eventually people turn around and wonder, well, who is running the show? And would we be better off with someone, as you say about the anti-elitism, would we be better off with someone who's more of a populist, who more sympathetic to someone like me, who may not be like me, but at least does not hate me and wants to do well for me. And so I think that is something that is a really big problem with, I guess, a form of secular liberalism, liberalism that is dominant around the centre, centre left of politics. And I, I'll be fascinated, for instance, in Germany to see how Schultz keeps everyone together on his team, because I would have thought his team has fractures that are natural fractures and 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 uh, divisions in a way that I think other coalitions do not. I, I could see Macron being very pragmatic in France and doing whatever he needs to. Macron's very good on energy. He's very good on nuclear power. He's very sensible on those things. I mean, I, I think the French would be fine, but I find the Germans very interesting because I'm, I'm not sure how Schultz exactly manages that to straddle all the different coalitions he needs to do. And it's a problem for the West because if Germany is divided, if Germany's uh, weak or confused, that's bad for all of us. A sick Germany is bad for all of us in the same way that a Germany that is too strong is bad for all of us, a Germany that is sick is bad for us. So I, I do find that very, very interesting. But to, to a bigger point, yes, I agree with you. I think the, the problem of a form of a secular elite who, who for whom feelings are the big thing that drive them, the need to feel virtuous and so on is a big thing versus in earlier generations when you had elites, you know, you even had you know, Kaisers and so on who felt they had some duty to their lower orders, that they had to look after them and they had to do things to, look, you know, to make sure that they were looked after. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Bismarck's. Bismarck sort of founded the modern welfare state. Bismarck took the view that the best way to solve civil strife and to avoid civil strife and to keep the, the country ch chugging along was to take the socialist issue away from them. You know, protect workers, protect their rights, make sure they've got good retirements, safe working conditions, living wage, we look after them. It, they take socialism's issue away from it. They will do that and it'll work well. Genius, man. I mean, Disraeli had very much the same idea in the United Kingdom. And, and that's, that's the sort of thinking that you need on the right. I, I would be against a form of uh, anti-elitism that results in sort of, uh, you know, sort of an anti-intellectual politics. So I think that's self-defeating as well. I think we're always going to have elites, whether we like them or not, we're always going to have elites. We just need better elites. And, and we need elites who are, who are better at their jobs. Uh, an American who I, I find very, very funny on these things, uh, Ben Dominic, he said, he said the, the problem of the modern world is that uh, elitism in itself is not bad. It's just that all our elites are terrible. And, and yeah, that's something I often, I often think of. You know, elitism in itself is not bad, but the elites we have are terrible. And so I think of that, but I just think we need better elites. And we, I think throughout the Western world also, we have sclerotic party systems that prevent new people coming in. I think that needs to change. Certainly that is the case in my Australia. Certainly that's obviously, that was obviously the case in America, which then got Trump, who was this kind of the irres irresistible force meeting the immovable object. And you just need you need new new people to come through and and, and new thinking that that but that is focused on the concrete problems, the boring problems, you know, security, energy, food, you know, cost of living, um, living wages, those sorts of things. And you know, and also people feeling that governments work for them. I, I know you work in, you know, I know you have a lot of experience to say like administra administration and administrative law. So do I. It's just one of those things where people have to feel that their government works for them and that that they're being treated fairly by the government and that and that. When they deal with government, it's it's a government they feel owned ownership in. Even even if they get adverse decisions from government, they feel that it's, it's theirs and that they feel it's something they they connect to and they want to hold on to and they see value in. I think that's very very important. I think one of the great things that worries me is alienated citizenry, where they don't feel they have any stake in the society, the economy, or the government itself. That's when you really are facing your problem. That's my last question, right? Because one of the great joys of following you on Twitter, for example, are your historical references. So it's a treasure trove of, of, uh, of history. And, you know, as, as Kissinger once said, since a character to a person is like history to a nation, one can never know enough history. So as a kind of your concluding remarks, what if uh, Bismarck would still be alive today, right? That he would have something to say. How do you think he would react to the current crisis? What would be a Bismarckian approach to the contemporary world we find ourselves in. Well, well thank you very much. You do me a great favor in, in uh, and, and great compliment in saying what you say. I, I'm a great lover of history. I obviously practice law, but history is my great love. And uh, you know, I was very encouraged by my late parents to be very interested in history and, and so on. And so I've always, I've always had a great love of history. What would Bismarck do? Well, one of Bismarck's 
sayings that I always think of. He, he once said that in a game of five, it is best to be one of three. And so he was always the, you know, the, the realist about how these things work. And um, he also said, you know, the, the cardinal policy, the cardinal end of all German policy should be to have a good relationship with Russians. So I, I think what Bismarck would do, honestly, is I think he would call a Congress of Berlin and he would have all the major powers sit down and there would be no press, no media, no one tweeting. You'd be all in a very large sort of ballroom with big maps everywhere. The doors would be locked and no one's getting out of there until they hammer out a peace settlement. That's that's what I think he would do. And I think everyone would have to bring their best uh, arguments to the table and have to, and they'd be having to trade things and have to agree things. And at the end of it, uh, no one gets out until everyone has signed up to some sort of settlement that would settle the issue at least for a few decades. And uh, I think he would say to the Ukrainians, we're going to reconstruct your country. We're going to help you. We're going to put you on a path to joining the European Union. I, I honestly do not think that's a big issue for the Russians. I think at the end of the day, that's an easy one for the Russians to fold on. Russia is going to trade with Ukraine. It would be very much to Russia's interest to have one you know, sort of Russian trading partner firmly that Russia has close relations with that is firmly in the European Union. At the end of the day, Russia and Ukraine, when the war is in, over, it's not going to change the fact that a lot of Russians and Ukrainians are married together. The Russians and Ukrainians live next to each other. I think actually would be, I think whatever the Russians say in public and private, I just don't think they'd have a big problem with Ukraine and the European Union. I think Ukraine on a path to join the European Union would help Ukraine. I think the Europeans are coming in and saying to the Ukrainians, there are governance reforms that you are going to have to do if you want to join the European Union on corruption, on how and transparency, on how you run things, because Ukraine is a very, very corrupt country. It's got a lot of corruption problems. There are ways that you're going to have to change if you want to join us. I think that would be helpful for, for, for the Ukrainians. I think the I think that's one thing Bismarck, as the mediator of this imaginary concert, I think that's one thing Bismarck would do. I think he'd also say to the Russians that we understand your grievances. We we undertake here that Ukraine will not be joining NATO and Georgia will not be jo joining NATO either. So you can have no complaints to your West and no complaints to your South. In return, you're going to guarantee that you are not going to attack them <laughs> again, and you understand this. And in return, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to ask things of you. And so, for instance, things like the the Azov coast, I think that would be something that you would ask back from the Russians. At the moment, the Russians are actually, as I look at it, the Russians have achieved all or close to all of their goals in, in the war. I I, I I cannot see why the Russians would continue unless if the unless the Russians really want Odessa. And that's basically to seal off Ukraine from the Black Sea. That's the only thing I can think of. So, absent that, I think a a mediator Bismarck would say to the Russians, "You've you've had a, you've had your win. It's come at a great cost to you, but you've, you've had a win. And so you've done what you've done. The bear the bear has borne its fangs. The bear has showed its claws. Now it's time for the bear to go back. And you know, in return, we will start to look at sanctions relief, and we will, we will stagger that based on how you behave. So at the end of this year, we will look at relaxing this." At the end of next year, we will look at relaxing some financial sanctions. At the end of this year, we will look at uh, you know, foreign brands and the like coming back to Russia. At the end of the day, the Russian elite doesn't is not always going to want to go to Beijing or go to India to shop for its brands, and so and so on and so forth. And you start to hold out some carrots. And now I think that's what Bismarck would do. I think I think the problem Bismarck would have in 2022 is that no one has a very long attention span. Everyone is intensely moralistic. And no one would want to be seen being the first person to approach the Russians in a quite practical and business-like way. Um, I, I know that I'm speaking to you. You're, you're in Vienna. You're in the heart of Metternich's uh, territory. Someone who's just practical and would sit down and say, we have issues, but we have to work these out. And it's in your interest, too, that we do this. And I think if there's one thing the sort of great geniuses of Central Europe could give at this time, it would be that pragmatic steer to a settlement of issues that do need to be settled. And you know, the, the other thing I think both a Metternich or a Bismarck would say is to the Russians is that we want you to settle this and in return, we'll settle other things that we know are of concern to you. So let's talk about the Balkans. You know, let's talk about the Black Sea generally. We'll bring the Turks in. Let's talk about the Turks. You know, let's bring in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Let's, let's have a bigger discussion. And people, whenever I've said this to people, people sort of laugh and I said, why? I said, when you're talking, you're not shooting. Even if this... Even if this dialogue takes a decade to, to go for, you know, even if this goes for a decade, goes for 15 years, you're at least talking. You know, it's, it's much more preferable to shooting. You know, ha having been in places where a lot of people have been being blown up, I can tell you there's far worse things than dialogue. You know, and and I've, I've never understood the aversion. I have to say that's one thing, uh, if I could just revisit my remarks, uh, that is one thing I've never understood in this crisis and, and in the last 20 years. 
the aversion to diplomacy and dialogue. There's no, you lose nothing through talking with people. You lose nothing. There's no shame in diplomacy. And one of the one of the people sort of I grew up when I grew up, the first real U.S. president I have a conscious memory of is Bush forty one, and he's the first. US, and he was all about talking and dialogue and diplomacy, even with people who he didn't. He, you know, America didn't get on with. He would talk to them. And, you know, this was a guy who was a fighter pilot in the Second World War, etc. Yeah, he was a yeah, he was a guy who I think fair to say didn't suffer from any anxiety about how tough he was. But but he was he was happy to talk to people and to have dialogue with people. And I think that's an attitude we need to have. I think you need to be able to talk to people, and I think diplomacy is incredibly important. Um, I think it's never been more important than now to have not just diplomacy, but a form of public diplomacy that explains to people that, yes, we are talking to X. I realise that you might not like us talking to X for Y reasons, but there is a reason why we're talking to X about Y because it leads to outcome Z that, that is going to be good for all of us. And this is this is a process we need to engage in and go through, and it's going to take time. And people understand this. People are not stupid. And I always take this. People underestimate their citizens and their voters at their own risk. People are not stupid. They understand this. They understand negotiating with difficult people. They do it in their daily lives. They understand all these sort of issues. They understand all these trade-offs. They understand that to govern is to choose. And I think that's a sort of that's a sort of you know, statecraft, if I can, a Bismarckian statecraft that I think all of us who are sensible could agree on. And I think it's something I would like to see more, I guess, small C conservative people talk about. Because I think one of the great things that conservatism brings to to government, and I mean conservatism with a small c, like it, it brings to government that I think liberalism does not, is conservatives, we accept, we begin that the world is imperfect. We believe, we begin with the fact that people are difficult. We begin with the fact that life will never be easy. We begin with the fact we will never create utopia. We have all these sort of things we already understand, which means that we're, I think, temperamentally just better suited to understanding a lot of these issues. And I think to the degree that uh, conservatives generally do one thing, I think we should, as much as possible, bring that sense to how government operates and and focus it on the, the practical outcomes that we can achieve in a realistic way. All right. On that note, thank you so much, Graham, for your time. And I already have to ask you, uh, I hope this was not the last time that we did this. I think there are so many fields that are untouched. I very much enjoyed this. Uh, anytime. I'm always happy to come back, Ralph. I very much enjoyed this. Thank you very much for having oh, me. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day or evening, I guess. Thank, thank you. you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.